So, my name is Michael Corr, and I'm a journalist. Uh, I founded Publit, which is a, a multimedia uh, publishing platform, digital publications. Uh, so, I think why uh, I was interested in this topic, and I think why we're all here, is understanding you know, where we're going with commenting on the web and, and conversation on the web in a way that maybe hasn't been lived up to all of its promise in the last few years. Um, and I think, you know, we, we look at uh, comments as, as like a side, something that's additional or on the side, but, but not maybe that important. But in fact, I think when you look back at history, annotation and marginalia and commenting was, was incredibly powerful. So the Talmud is the Jewish civil law and ceremonial law is commentary. Uh, from its last theorem was scribbled in the margin of a book. Um, when you look at uh, a, used book, a used book dealers will tell you that students look for books that have the common and it's more valuable. But Galileo, ancient books that margin are more valuable. So there's a distillation, distillation of wisdom, I think, that, that comes with, yes, the canonical text, but also with that commentary that comes with it. And so uh, that wasn't lost on the founder of the World Wide Web, Tim, Tim, Bernard Lee, Tim Berners Lee. Uh, actually envision having an annotation layer across the entire web, but because the technology hadn't yet caught up with the reality or his desires, that it never actually uh, uh, materialized. And at the time, a lot of people didn't see the value. The NSF said that's, that's actually, they, he applied for a grant from the NSF, they said it's not, it's not worth it, there's no technical merit to it. Um, and so uh, here we are today. And uh, there are hundreds of millions, maybe billions of comments, and annotation being made uh, each year and obviously um, there's a lot of interest in what that means uh, for the future of an audience that writes more than you um, which they will always do so and as a journalist that's both exciting and demoralizing um, but they didn't write better though necessarily so I just want to introduce uh, both of you and um, because we live in an era of transparency and government surveillance, surveillance, I just decided to take everything I knew on the web and then make up a bio for you. So please tell me how wrong. So Dan, uh, Dan Whaley is from uh, Hypothesis, which is an open source project building a conversation layer, uh, annotation layer on the web. And um, he has uh, 1,282 tweets. Uh, he's uh, incredibly fortunate to have a front seat during the most extraordinary moment in human history. He's a coder and entrepreneur. Uh, he started the first, on, well, the largest online travel uh, company on the web uh, back in '95, and uh, eventually he kept 50% of the market uh, at the time. And uh, he's a faculty at Singularity University, very interested in climate change, uh, and was working on ways to uh, sequester carbon through uh, iron fertilization, uh, actually. So I'd like to hear more about that at some point. Um, and like both people here, humanities major, philosophy. Uh, Philosopher from the University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign, and he now directs Sauce Labs and Get Around on the board as well as Hypothesis. Uh, it's two tweets. I picked two tweets because I think they're funny. Uh, so the team is on fire. So much development and design work getting done. Incredible to behold. And then Jeff Bezos, uh, retail, got it. Now onto news. So um, it's head of product. Uh, this is Sam Parker. He's the head of product at Discus. And uh, discuss. sorry, discuss, discuss, <laughs> discuss. Um, Fan of food, uh, cycling, baseball, big data analytics, SQL, as those things all go together. Um, and so he started off, I think, at uh, Gamers.com, and then went PC editor, and ended up uh, at uh, CBS for a while. And, and CNET. CNET, okay. Um, so quite a bit of uh, technology and media all mixed up. Uh, and of course, he also comes from a humanities background, history and French uh, from Berkeley, which I find fascinating. Um, and um, so two great quotes, two great tweets from you, one retweeting from Bill Murray, grammar, the difference between knowing your shit and knowing you are shit. <laughs> and um, my favorite part of winning the major sports event, random acts of congratulations, so many high fives, my, my hand hurts. Um, so thank you both for coming. Uh, what we're going to do is have a five, ten minutes for each person to talk, and then I want this to be a conversation uh, appropriately. So why don't we, uh, who wants to go first? Sure. Okay. So discuss does comments, um, but more than comments. So our goal is is really community, um, and we think of ourselves as the community of communities. And from comments to community is a pretty long way. Um, all posts, anything that a user can contribute across the web, can be a comment. And on on some very real level, a YouTube uh, video 
um, that someone posts can be a comment. And there's comments on comments. Uh, a tweet can be a comment. All these, th these different elements, these different containers, um, aren't really all that different. Um, Discuss is just doing uh, comments that are on articles usually, on videos usually, but we have people who are implementing us in a wide range of ways. We're, we're really a platform and, um, and our product makes it really easy to just drop us, us right on a web page. But we've seen a range of, of implementations. We see on one side communities. Um, one community that, that a lot of people know is abc.com, Fred Wilson's blog. Um, one of our early investors, and it's a, it's a really, really uh, active community where at this point there's so many other VCs that participate in there that, that people go just for the comments, and he's basically just creating a uh, kind of an initial header of theme, and then there's all this discussion where um, someone will pile on and other people will pile on. And one, one of the things we love about that dy dynamic is that critical mass where um, someone is posting the original blog post, but then there are insightful comments that bubble up, and we spend a lot of time trying to bubble the right ones up for the initial visitor to that page, and then this whole uh, thread of, of discussion. And one of the challenges is, is even finding that. Um, I, I, you know, before I joined Discuss, I think there was one moment when I, when I did stumble on ABC, but finding a, a great community is a, is a pretty hard thing online. Um, so creating on-ramps to that is something we've been actively working on. Not all posts, not all comments are created equal. Not all communities are created equal. We really love seeing active, um, active discussions where people are replying to each other, not just replying to the parent, um, to the uh, the original blogger. And and that's just because we go in there and just personally we find those more interesting to read. We talk to people and they find that their participation. And the feedback that we give, because people love to get sort of the, the bit of ego stroking of how many people uh, appreciated my comment, how many people replied to my comment, we do that in real time as much as we can. Um, it's that critical mass and even that, that trending velocity of, of discussions that we use to help people find really interesting things to talk about. And so when we look, about, look at um, sort of the range of things that, that our comments can refer to, uh, generally, it's referring to a URL, right? But often people can actually start a discussion in, say, a mobile app. Uh, we've seen people do it off of Foursquare location data, um, where the reference to the conversation is just a location. We've seen um, where people are referring to a particular video game character, and they have a whole web page where there are all these different um, co discuss powered conversations through the whole page uh, that are about these different. Um, video game or movie characters. So we've seen very annotation-like implementations. And when we think about, OK, how should we develop our software? How, how should we recommend to people, based on seeing a lot of people use our software, how to build a community? The, the kinds of communities that we zero in on um, for, and, and say, we want more like that, are ones that have critical, critical mass, where they have velocity. And one of the things that, that really tends to determine that and when I go and I run my data, um, and, and the product managers go and look at it, some, some really key stats are, you know, what's the, what's the ratio of uh, replies to different people? What's the number of comments and sort of the, the velocity, the time in between comments? And we like the uh, discussion threads that are somewhat bigger, dozens, maybe low hundreds of comments. Once you get much beyond that, it starts to feel like this big public place and everyone's shouting to get attention. But if it's dozens or low hundreds, it feels like there, there are other people are really going to see you. You can intuitively, you know that other people are going to see you because they're reacting right next to you. And so it sort of creates this, this natural soapbox. And when you sort of chop and chop and chop the, the size of the referent down to like the event level or um, those video game characters that are being annotated that I mentioned, um, we, we see kind of a problem with, with generating critical mass. We have not yet figured out how to do both of the things we care about, which is get enough critical mass and allow people to talk about one particular part of the page, and we haven't productized that, um, though that's certainly you know, actually pretty interesting to us. Cool. Thank you. you want to do a demo? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, Overview and or talk first. 
So hi, my name is Dan Whaley. Um, there's two of us here, me and Randall Leeds, um, my, our lead developer, and we have a team of about six or seven um, distributed around um, the planet. Um, and uh, so we'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing. So this is um, a, a preposition, a proposition, um, a goal maybe. This is kind of how we think about what we're trying to do. And so you might ask, what, why, um, why annotation, right? We know why knowledge is important. And the best way I've found to kind of discuss this or to, to kind of illustrate this is to think about going back in time a thousand years and looking at key things like the Magna Carta or the Declaration of Independence or documents that are important to us that form our, our documented history and realizing that we really don't know too much about the what led into forming that particular document, the discussions that led into it, um, the the back channel between co-authors, the uh, maybe the peer review of uh, right after the initial drafts were created, um, or even the discussion that formed immediately after the thing became publicly available. Um, or anything in the ensuing um, couple hundred years. I mean, we have points of inspection um, from historical documents that may maybe reference it, but we don't have fine-grained uh, commentary. And so a question is, um, is this something that we can create? And today, in 2013, we have more information being created uh, per second per second than uh, probably in all history. Um, laws, journal articles, news, uh, religious texts, things like Wikipedia, tweets, blogs. Um, but our commentary, our ability to have a conversation about those things is still fairly limited. It's balkanized, um, it's not open, um, and um, the ways that, that that commentary can evolve oftentimes get shut down. Uh, things like posterists and um, places that we store our thinking are subject to the whims of um, the places that we store them. So, um, you know, 2013 is one question. What about in 10 years? Um, what's the landscape going to look like then? Uh, and how do we think about starting to preserve what we're doing now, not just even for 10 years, um, but maybe a thousand? Um, imagine being able to look back in a thousand years and see the conversation about all the world's knowledge with powerful search tools that would let you dive into a specific <coughs> year, to a specific uh, document, and see the conversation that have, had evolved around, um, around that document at that point. And it sounds kind of fantastic or maybe crazy, but um, I actually think, we actually think this is something that's within our ability to, to create. So Hypothesis is a nonprofit. Uh, it's a uh, it's a nonprofit project to enable the community-moderated annotation of the world's knowledge. Um, we're funded right now through grants um, from foundations, Sloan, Shuttleworth, Knight, and the Mellon Foundation. And this is a pretty old idea. Um, as Michael uh, mentioned, a few of the data points. Um, our first point of reference in the digital um, paradigm for annotation goes back to Vannevar Bush who uh, wrote the um, famous 1945 article in the Atlantic called As We May Think, where he imagined this thing which has become the web, and uh, the thing which has become the web browser that he called the Memex machine. Um, fast forward to uh, uh, 1993. This is uh, Mark Andreessen's call for people to uh, beta test their group annotation plug-in for Mosaic, the first version of Mosaic, which they turned on for a little while and then turned off uh, because um, they realized the scope of the service that they would have to run um, to operate this thing. Uh, and in a blog post last year, he kind of regrets uh, having turned this off and wonders on um, what the web would have been like if we would have had all of that 20 years of, of layered discussion um, as a result. Uh, and another one, Larry Page, um, out of uh, Steve Levy's book, um, a very interesting reference I just discovered a couple weeks ago that Page's original dissertation topic was on how to build a collaborative annotation layer on the web. Um, and as a result of that, thinking about how you would decide which comment would get 
preference and, and how to sort signal from noise, ultimately settled on page rank uh, as, as his thesis. So this is something that's been in people's minds for a long time. There's a ton of projects, um, Roadkill, some of them, um, that um, have tried to do something more like this. We actually have a, um, a history that we try to keep in a Google spreadsheet of them. Um, and uh, we have 60 projects we've been tracking over the last uh, 20, since Mosaic, um, that have been trying to do this. So this is a, a rich landscape. Um, but what's new is that there's a group of people over the last couple of years that have come together um, to form an interoperable standard for how to create annotations, how to um, share them, and how systems can uh, be interoperable with each other. So if one system creates an annotation, another can read it. Uh, and this is now a W3C a working group called uh, Open Annotation. Uh, and there's, um, they've made a lot of progress. They have um, data standards, and they're settling on kind of a topology for what an annotation looks like and some thoughts about um, things that an annotation can do and things that it can't. So um, for me, an annotation is kind of this very simple thing, which is uh, like a tail, uh, or like an arrow, rather, with a, with a payload. It has a tip and a tail and a thing that it kind of carries with it. So this is similar to marginalia, as Michael mentioned. Um, here's, uh, this is um, Sir Isaac Newton's uh, uh, scribble in the margin of a treatise on optics. Uh, and this has two elements of of a modern digital annotation. It has the thing that it's talking about and the very specific location within that document. And then it has the payload, the thing that's being said. So this is the, what Isaac Newton actually created. And what we get with open annotation, with digital annotations now, is the addressability of that annotation. So the annotation itself is a web object um, that can be shared um, and with other people and pointed to so that it forms uh, the continuous chain very much like a hypertext link. So now on the web we have hypertext links that point generally to the top of things. We have anchor tags, but anchor tags inside the documents are generally established by the people who create them. So what's possible with annotation is the ability for people that were formerly the audience, um, as Michael said, to now create links between very specific things and other very specific things on the web that other people like them can discover. Um, not just once on a page, but because we're pointing inside pages, uh, maybe fine-grained analysis, as a person uh, points out, the points of an argument to uh, elements of the evidence or, or the basis for it. And not just in documents, but in things like media, um, video to specific time codes or areas and in, in video or images. And also, um, one of the biggest uh, use cases for annotation now that the Open Annotation Group is focused on is data. So how can people that are studying a specific gene inside of a genomic sequence for the fruit fly see and discover papers and threads of research that other researchers are doing because they're at the key thing, which is the real estate, it's the gene that they're interested in. And they're there at the gene, and, from, and the gene is the point of discovery for all things um, that relate to it. Uh, so we, um, this is, um, uh, a lot of people are starting to work on this. There was a conference earlier this year in San Francisco. We had 100 people from around the world that are working on projects and also implementations of annotation come together in San Francisco to uh, talk about uh, how to build this shared vision. Um, there's also an interesting project called Annotator that a lot of these efforts are built on top of, including our own, um, which is starting to become uh, the platform on which, in the API layer, for which a diversity of different annotation projects can be layered on top of. So uh, we have our own uh, uh, effort, which I'll, I can demo for you. Um, so you, sh you can download that and try it now, uh, if you like. Um, at hypothesis slash alpha. Um, you can also take the code and use it, um, run it yourself, run your own annotation server and, and layer, uh, and then um, help us uh, build it. In fact, um, this, today we were talking to a group of folks in, uh, at the University of Mary Washington 
and uh, one of the folks there has just built our first uh, WordPress plugin uh, so that you can add hypothesis to your blog, for instance, on WordPress, which is great. Um, so I'll just give you, take a minute and just give you a quick uh, demo of what this would look like, um, what this does look like. So we have a, this is the hypothesis alpha page. Uh, we have a Chrome plugin right now, so there's, um, there's a, there's a, or an extension rather, there's an extension, there's a bookmarklet. This is also code that you can embed on the page itself if you want to uh, layer annotations on a page without depending on your audience bringing the extension to it um, using, for instance, like the WordPress plugin. So if I click uh, on the plugin, I can add it um, to my browser. And then I'll show you a page. Uh, we did a, a workshop at uh, Berkman this last week on annotation in the law, and we I invited them to kind of collaboratively annotate uh, this um, canonical version of Roe v. Wade. Um, so the hypothesis extension and or toolkit is visible on the right. Um, if you open it up, you can see uh, that um, there's a variety of different annotations um, that people have made. You can see that as I scroll down them that you can see the actual text. Um, that the person selected. These are, you know, kind of nonsensical, so I wouldn't read too much into them. But um, there, if you click on one, you can see the source that the person annotated, um, what the person said, and then the threaded reply structure um, below that initial annotation. And you know, I can create um, a new one right here. So. Uh, I can add a tag to that if I want. Um, uh, so there's kind of a tagging capability. Um, there's a search function here. So if I want to search all of the annotations um, on this particular document, I can search for a word like test. And a lot of people have said the word test, including myself. Um, so I can get results that, that relate to um, search uh, this is a faceted search, so I can add new terms to it, like um, a particular user. Uh, and then I get that result. Um, every annotation is, like I said, a web object. So not only um, is this uh, annotation here a web object, which means I can grab a URL to it, but um, all of the th uh, elements in the threaded replies are each their own object. So I can go to a new tab uh, and I can see w what that particular uh, annotation or that particular reply was. Um, eventually, we'll actually build the capability to take you back to the original source page as opposed to this interstitial page. Um, so that's kind of a quick um, demo of what annotation might look like layered on top of the web as we know it. And this is the beginnings of what we're uh, working on. Uh, we also, if you go to GitHub, we have a roadmap which we're very interested in feedback on. So we have a release that we're focused on right now, which includes some of the things I'm demoing to you right now, tagging and search and things like that. But also, importantly, features that we're focused on uh, after this next uh, um, month or so, and, um, like groups and things like that. So I'll end it right Thanks. there. Yep. That's great. So um, I guess the first thing I wanted to ask, and it's a bit of the elephant in the room when it comes to commenting and, and, and annotation, is how do you maintain quality? So I think when, as soon as you talk about user-generated content, who thinks of uh, Galileo, Noble Thoughts, and you know, great content? Not that many. So, uh, I mean, you've, you've had a lot of experience with this. You have millions of comments a day, and I think you've probably thought about this quite a bit. What's your take on how do you keep and maintain quality? So, two general approaches. One is highlight the good stuff, and the other is police the bad stuff. You're right. uh, you know, policing the bad stuff, or, or hiding the bad stuff. Um, so, on the on the bad stuff side, the, the first sort of um, relatively solved part of it is, is just spam. There's 
It's just like email spam. There are a bunch of uh, templates for that. The, the problem with stuff that isn't spam but is bad stuff is that every different community has, has their own standards. That's what sort of defines a community is, that, is, is the social norms and the, the sort of shared interests uh, of that community. And our software, one of the most basic functions is, is the ability for a community leader to say, hey, this person can't participate in this community because they're just behaving poorly. Um, there's a range of things that, that we need to do to uh, make sure that someone who does not choose to identify themselves with the real name, does not, does not choose to sort of, you know, sort of really put, put uh, you know, Facebook identity out there like that, but that they are, hey, I'm, I'm using my alias because this is a particular, uh, maybe it's a, for example, video games. So I use, use my video game handle when I'm talking in video game communities, separate from my business um, uh, communities where I use my real name. So Discuss needs to sort of intermediate and say, hey, even though this user isn't choosing to use their real name, the community has chosen to reject this person because they're a bad actor. Okay, well, Discuss now needs to make sure that this user can't just sock puppet and come in and choose to identify themselves differently and behave just as badly. That just creates a big mess for the community leader. So that's a, that's a class of things that we need to sort of provide as a platform, we find, because at the end of the day, our job, uh, the, sort of the, the user promise that we have for community leaders, bloggers, uh, news sites like CNN and The Atlantic that use us, is to take as much of that effort off of their, uh, you know, really small community management teams, their authors who are brave enough to, to venture forth and, and participate. Um, we want to make that as easy as possible, so the software does as much of that as possible. On a scale of 1 to 10, in terms of, I feel like you're effectively policing your or letting the community sort of police itself where do you feel like you fall? I would say on the on the spam side where we tend to be an eight or a nine. On the identity management side we're probably um, we're we're not in that great range, um, but we're also not um, terrible in terms of the, the blacklists and um, us being able to sort of identify users across uh, accounts and respect the community leaders' um, ability. So there I would say what our intent is to do a lot better and we know how to do that. Um, and then there's there's sort of a whole class of other things where we have, we have a user reputation feature. We look at how people behave across the whole range of sites. We use community signals like people who are downvoting um, and upvoting. That's sort of the most most effective ways, uh, I sort of got to the highlight the good stuff, hide the bad stuff, our sorting mechanism um, is actually pretty effective um, across most communities. There are some communities where uh, they're, they're just a bunch of jokers and they, and they end up like voting really, really bad stuff. Um, but uh, generally speaking, that, that works pretty well. Um, user reputation works pretty well to look across the whole network, say, this user generally gets downvoted, this user generally is behaving badly, let's warn the community moderators and then provide some interface elements and, and sort of the, the power tools so they can more quickly uh, weed those users out and say, oh, okay, I don't want them on my site. We could do a lot more on the curation side to bump up the, the good stuff. Um, we, quite frankly, just haven't monetized a bunch of our ideas there. So your model of a well-functioning community requires a human. So we are not aware of a way for us not to impose some sort of discuss way of communities to run and to have that all be algorithmic. So in order for us to believe that communities need to be different and lots of different communities exist and we don't impose content standards on those communities, um, we really need the, the human signals, the, the community leader curation, um, a little bit of effort every once in a while to, do, to deal with the, the, ba the bad folks and then uh, the community participants really to say what they appreciate. So Dan, you're, you, you're taking probably a little more open approach or like you're, you're Wild West, right? So your whole structure is open, you really can't control in any way, or I guess in some ways, but tell us where you feel like the line between control and openness should fall for you to, to maintain quality. I guess I don't see control and openness as being opposite poles. Um, I think uh, you need 
uh, any community that doesn't moderate itself or have moderation. Um, if, you, if you give people a crayon and you tell them they can scribble on the web, they're going to scribble. So I think we need to, you know, communities need guidance and they, you know, our ideal is that the community moderates itself. So this is a pretty well established um, um, line of research and practice in uh, online systems, reputation theory. Um, and I would agree that there's a basic noise floor that you need to establish through pretty simple algorithms and techniques to detect spam and maybe obvious trolls. Um, those are sometimes hard to define, but you can probably get into that territory. And then we need to find ways to create headroom between um, the best stuff and the, um, the worst stuff. And I think there's a variety of very interesting techniques, stuff that we're exploring right now to use not only the community to do that, but also to push moderation opportunities to people that have knowledge in those particular areas. So kind of topic clustered moderation uh, as opposed to just getting everybody to every moderate everybody. So that's, um, you know, obviously we're still pre-launch and we're not dealing with the reality of tons of traffic, but it's something we're very focused on. It's why we're still in alpha right now and uh, it's, um, we're looking forward to working with that and getting feedback from people. So about the systems to require people to register with pseudonym, uh, some sort of persistent identity, can you talk about the research that you found in the thought process and the potential between requiring people to register with real names, pseudonyms, some sort of persistence, and how that affects the reputation of a lot of your advisors? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's a fascinating, really, really interesting area. Um, Right now, we require a pseudonym. Um, uh, we, we're fans of pseudonymity um, and the ability for people to have identity that they can either lend their real name to or not. Um, but also, but obviously, anonymity pl has played a really interesting role in some very, very powerful communities. Wikipedia, 4chan, and actually HuffPo, which for the news this week, I don't know if other people have seen it, are actually going to turn their anonymous uh, comments off. Uh, for the first time that they've um, since they've started, so um, because of you know obviously difficulty in, in managing that, I think our best guesstimate is that persistent identity is probably important to have a high quality community. Maybe once um, you establish a persistent identity, then you might be able to make anonymous comments occasionally, um, leveraging your reputation. But because in a certain circumstance um, there's reasons why um, you'd prefer not to reveal that. Um, but stability of identity seems to be important. Um, we, I don't think real names are uh, an essential piece of, of high quality. So when you register for your hypothesis accounts, I mean the raw term, do you require users to tie it to a real ID? To, we need an email address at the moment. Okay. Um, so you don't take it to an IP or an IP? But we are uh, we are looking at supporting um, external systems like uh, Mozilla's Persona and also um, you know things like OAuth and stuff for people who uh, can authenticate users and um, for us. So one thing that uh, in speaking with you both, there seemed to be an interesting difference is this idea of comment comments and community versus annotation, and, and annotation is, can be very much of a solo activity. Um, tell, maybe talk a little bit more about what you feel like, how important community is to your product and what you do and the idea of interacting on the web versus the idea of adding one more piece of information to this thread or this topic. Because there, there is quite a bit of difference and I want to get your thoughts on how this works. I think our, our reason for being is, is community and people commenting in a way that's public where other people can see it and other people can participate. So we have a strong bias towards discussions um, versus reactions. Uh, we, we used to have a feature that was called reactions that where we were pulling in um, a feed of Twitter uh, comments against a given article, a given URL. And we actually turned it off. Um, it was just really, really noisy. It was the kind of thing that you see on Twitter where people are reacting to URLs. Twitter discussions exist. There are real people who talk about thing, uh, about with each other, but they're not tending to talk about a URL. Most of the stuff about a URL is just a retweet with a couple of comments. 
So that was just one specific example where we built something. We had it for a long time. People thought it was kind of important because um, a lot of a lot of site owners like the volume. They like the perception of of engagement. Oh, there's I'm a small site, but but at least I've gotten a bunch of retweets of of my page. Um, that's just one specific example where we turned it off because it just does not meet our quality standards. Doesn't feel like a community. Doesn't feel like discuss. And discuss is really about discussions. So. Uh, we, have a, we have a bias towards looking for features that help the, the community leaders achieve their goals, which tend to be around generating engagement and, and feeling like there is, it is a community, there are participants around their, their content, around the, the context that they're trying to create. So a lot of what we, the value that we provide and, and how we prioritize and improvements is trying to generate incremental participation. So I think if I understood the question, that there's a continuum between personal research, um, highlighting annotation for my own purposes, um, and then the kinds of interaction that I might have with people around me. There was until you showed your demo, and now I'm totally confused because you have both. You have a conversation within your annotations, which is something right. that's, I would say new. Yeah, um, and also uh, I don't know if we showed it here, but there's a you know a highlighting tool. Um, that we can t that you can turn on and just make highlights on a page for yourself. So this is actually interesting feedback from uh, a journalism workshop we did um, uh, about a month and a half ago, where the journalists were kind of like, a lot of what we need is just tools to examine long form documents that are the basis of research inputs that we that might form an article. We want to be able to create digital annotations um, or digital highlights of those that we can store and record in our timeline and then go back to and turn into an annotation that we can then reference in an article later. So I, I, I guess I see this spectrum between personal use and social use as being something that we hopefully can do with the same toolkit um, and just at different times in our workflow. And also in kind of you know private modes where we're working with a team to collaboratively annotate a draft of a document before um, that document com becomes public. So you wouldn't say community is one of your explicit goals necessarily? No, community ultimately is the goal of humans because we're social animals. Sure. So I think it's, it is the terminus, the, the end point that, that our things feed into. Interesting. Yeah, yeah good. Yeah. Um, I'm uh, also more. Um, I'm uh, fascinated with this, and I uh, appreciate the foresight that, that you bring to this uh, technology and the use of that technology. But the uh, what I'm interested in is um, the attention that you might have, or any research you might have, on the, the younger generations. I mean, there's a lot of skill sets required for this, um, but I think there's also a need uh, to give attention to attitudes, people's attitudes, and how attitudes shift and change over generations. And if you have any research or any um, information about young, younger generations, that maybe as far back as uh, um, uh, uh, preschool or elementary school, uh, thinking of the work of Seymour Packard and how that influenced a lot of the behavioral um, uh, 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 outcomes of the use of technology. Are you looking at the younger generations and attitudes in terms of use of this? It's very pioneering. Well, my quick reaction is that whenever I meet a young person today, even a very young person, I am blown away at how um, totally all over technology they are at a very, very fast level. Um, I don't. I'm personally not um, knowledgeable about maybe the kinds of paradigms you're talking about in terms of. Um, enabling very, very young people to, to do these kinds of things or how they might interact with this, but they're fast learners. I don't have any particular data or learning on the, um, kind of the, the, the early, early age group. I mean, we, we certainly see communities where um, there are plenty of teens and, and college age uh, participants, but I haven't really seen specific use uh, discussed um, in preteens. So uh, it seems like a lot of what you guys are doing is blurring the lines about what content, what annotation or comment or just content period is. And I look at Wikipedia, for example, and 
that essentially uh, is a series of comments or annotations by an audience that has created a coherent article, narrative, whatever you want to call it. And so that line between a, uh, you know, a, an article or a document and then what has been commented on is completely destroyed. Um, or, or it's a, a fluid spectrum, let's say. And so what, what do you feel like the ability to do what you're enabling um, in, in terms of comments and annotation changes the nature of knowledge? Does that mean that we're going to get to a point where Wikipedia at the time was completely counterintuitive, that that ever be so ac more accurate than the Encyclopedia Britannica? Do you see us going to a place where the Wikipedia is actually probably the more uh, dominant form of knowledge, a like group created knowledge through annotation, or do you, because we live in the opposite world now, but that's the exception? I would say that. Um we're getting to the place where these kinds of tools increase the metabolism of knowledge. I mean, knowledge is something that is this nebulous thing that we all kind of mutually agree on and realize as being the, the event horizon of what we collectively know. Right? And if, if our ability to interact and our ability to have a conversation um, is, increases, then it's, uh, I think the impact of that is quite profound. If you take the vehicle of scientific knowledge, which has generally been, you know, the the scientific journal article, and you um, and you realize that there is no commentary on that, that the only commentary on the journal article has been its citation in another paper that was peer reviewed that may come out a year or a couple of years or three years afterwards, and. But what if you were able to go to the journal article and see the layered commentary as a, on top of that? You know, days or weeks after that, uh, after it came out, what if you were able to see the pre-publication um, peer review as a component of that, and and even extended forward past the publication date? Because somebody who read the article after it was published commented on a something that one of the peer reviewers said from before when it, you know the publication happened. So I see what's coming um, with some of these new tools and paradigms as being completely disruptive from, in terms of the metabolism of, of knowledge, um, and I think it's amazing. I think the, the immediacy and the context of reactions um, with web technology today is, is pretty radically different than when I was a tech writer at the start of the uh, decade, and I'd get emails about how terrible my reviews were, or correcting me on this or that, and then had a forum that was, you know, sort of just slightly uh, apart from the article pages to then having uh, comments. That was sort of a, an evolution over, over five or ten years. Um, there, there was something uh, really, I think, energizing about seeing all of the uh, reactions right in place and, and sort of seeing, um, you know, get, getting email notifications about that. But also, it was so much more likely that, that someone might say something and then someone else would challenge it when it was in the context of either a forum or in a, co a comment. Um, and, and even if I didn't go back and, and change my article, it was available for, for everyone else to read sort of right there in the moment. Um, I think I, I always still, though, kind of, and I think there's, there's some part of this baked into how I discuss things, there's this moment in certain forum communities where really long form um, discussion that, that lasts, some threads last over months and years, that's something really special in how those kinds of, 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 of maybe sometimes forum ticks and the way people behave in forums, that's pretty special. And, and you know, it's one of the reasons why we love uh, to get sort of these bigger, deeper, meatier discussions. Oh, no, I have one question. Okay. Yeah, I think you said earlier, uh, unfortunately, since you can't see uh, the stuff, I, I, I did, but I can't recall the details. Mm-hmm, absolutely. And, and does that move the comment on the thread? It does. Okay. So did you say earlier that sometimes comments that were, there were certain communities that voted up certain comments that were not shared by the, yeah, so, so for example, there's um, one of the sites that, that uses us, it's very, like, really large and was my competitor for a long time, IGN. Um, they, uh, uh, it, it's great to have them on Discuss, and they have some, a really interesting video game, a um, very young uh, audience, and sometimes uh, there's certain uh, jokers, griefers, that will just 
put the funniest one-liner they can and get as many upvotes as possible. It has nothing to do with the article, but it's actually a very simple way of, of defeating the sort of basic popularity algorithm. So, so and people, ones that don't deal with extremely young people, like regular discussed comment threads, do you find that, that uh, comments that rise up the thread are, aren't especially good? So the, the specific voting algorithm that, that we use is, is really trying to um, look at how much signal we get. And so the comments that are older, if they get enough downvotes, they will drop. Um, it's not just time. It's not just um, kind of the, the, the pure percentage of upvotes to downvotes. Um, so if somebody cares enough to upvote it and enough people care enough to downvote it, it tends to sort of find its natural buoyancy. Um, one of the things that, that we see that, that can be a challenge with the, that kind of system is people who come back, who care enough to come back to that article um, kind of session after session over the course of a day. Uh, there, there are some discussions that I find that really useful for. People tend to switch immediately back into the newest view so they can really sort of immediately scan um, what's new to them. And as we think about where there are really important ways for us to make comments feel, make the comment, the quality feel better for as many people as possible. It's in those sorting uh, modes and how do we do create curation and allow different kinds of users to uh, really have a say on what's showing up. Those, those are really powerful. Chris? Yeah, I'm curious about what, if anything, might happen in the quote-unquote real world, the world beyond the page, as a result of these discussions that happen. Uh, I'm interested if that's something that like, you guys want or expect anything, you know, an event, an action, a relationship, anything off the page to happen as a result of this conversation. Is that something you would cultivate, or is the conversation as a result of that? We've seen stories break because of comments. Um, and it's, it's, it's the internet as we know it today. I mean, there's, there's awesome stuff that's happening in comments that's happening on Twitter. And when it's when it's the it's a big enough community and there's a big enough stage and someone has something to say and other people see it, it can have a massive impact. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. That, I mean, the dis you know the discussions that we have about things that are important to us are are as important as the thing itself. So, I mean, if uh, that's part of our discussions are part of real life. It's not. Just the internet. It's it's who we are. So, so I would say yes. So what's the role of the author in this? Uh, you know, in some journal organizations, they the journalists just refuse to get involved with the big boy. In other places, you get fired if you don't. So what uh, where do you guys think they, they should fit? So we see, and we have some some stats that I think we've published um, that that are uh, when an author, and we can identify the author because uh, the site is. is told us has done a little bit of CMS integration. Um, when the author participates, the engagement goes up. We give the author a special um, badge that designates their, uh, their, their, their role in the community, and that tends to call, uh, call out more reactions, and just in, in general, the, the tone is set. I think the more that really good, article, really good comments can bubble up, it also sets a tone for all the comments that follow. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think author um, participation is key. Um, you know, authors are you know different. Though. Some hate to engage with the audience. Um, some don't. I don't think we're going to change that. I think when you can provide better tools that increase the quality of engagement that the audience can provide. Um, you know, there's interesting features that you can do with with annotation, like somebody can highlight a a spelling error or, or something like that. And if we can identify the author through integration, um, then you can, you know, the author can say, oh, you know, I got a text message that there's a, you know, a, a spelling error. And I think that's a, the audience begins to provide a service um, to the author, which can increase the engagement. And they're not just an irritant um, anymore. So. Oh. Okay, we have one or two more questions. So I think you're waiting. Um, this is what I want to say the Guardian. As a director, the Guardian is actually the Guardian newspaper is actually measuring and doing studies on, on comments. So, what we talk about today. Um, 
but I also want to know how are you telling, or are you learning anything what's the difference between reactionary comments and discussions from your point of view? Would you see at some point a conversation changes into something and what happens with the food? Why are you, are you collecting any information? Well, I think anecdotally, um, we've probably all seen examples where discussion threads, you, you can get a side conversation, that side conversation is no longer really interesting to the general um, group of people that are just reading through the main conversation thread. And we've definitely looked at, at UI implementations that below a certain depth of conversation, it just doesn't need to show up. Um, we haven't productized that, but uh, things just, you, you look at enough of these and um, that tends to happen. The, the other thing I would say is that you can really profile a community based on the percentage of comments that are replies to other comments versus uh, comments that are just replies to the main article. Um, I mean, when I, when I just basically sort all the, all the communities on our network um, and, and you see all the, the communities that are very just response to the original article, it doesn't feel like a community. It's just a bunch of... Um, it's not, I wouldn't say necessarily a first post, but it tends to be I agree or disagree, um, and uh, it doesn't really feel like a discussion. So I think there, there's some broad strokes examples of, of how that feels. So um, my understanding is that being able to download things is, is somewhat controversial. I mean, you've got one of the five stars, you've got up or down, you've got just simply plus one. What, I mean, what's your thinking on that? It's definitely controversial. There have been communities that, that have disliked that feature. Um, there are communities that also dislike uh, the fact that people can see who upvotes. I mean, there, there's, that's sort of the funny thing about um, every decision we make. And, and certain decisions we make are so core to how Discuss works and so core to how we need to make sure that, that people who go from site to site have a certain set of expectations for how they work, that we don't make them optional. Others, other decisions, like whether or not someone can post as a guest so they don't even have a real uh, email account, we allow that as part of our feature set, but a community can turn that on and off. A community can also turn on or off whether or not they want to pre-moderate everything. But upvoting and seeing who upvotes and downvoting, but only allowing registered users who identify themselves to downvote, right now seems to be a good uh, balance so that naturally there are more upvotes, so people who who feel sort of attacked by having any downvotes, really they're more likely to get uh, a positive upvote to downvote ratio. And, and we don't need any, I mean, we don't, we don't need them to be on the same system for the algorithm to work. Uh, there it's just, it, we're, we're sort of tuning for human psychology and for the, re the reward mechanism. And generally speaking, people want um, to have a little bit more positivity in their lives. Um, there's a range of different approaches that different communities take. Um, Reddit, Hacker News, and some disallow, uh, Stack Overflow, I think, disallows uh, downvotes up until you have a certain reputation threshold. And so um, for us, it's really a question of experimentation. Um, let's see what works. Let's get some data and, and then um, tune the system based on that. So I want to ask a question I can use here. So you raised the notion of downvotes, and so I, I full disclosure for work discuss, but um, something that I found interesting is that communities kind of have diametrically opposing views sometimes on what is good, and that's where I think the downvote question gets really interesting, is when you have this system that crosses many communities, and then you have individuals from one community visiting another, and then imposing their idea. So if you have someone from a conservative website, visiting a progressive website, they're going to bring the way that they use that community with them. And so I just, you know, uh, so I know that from my experience when we discuss, I was very curious, how would something similar apply to the annotation side of things, where you have a much more seeming like, you know, seeming more Wikipedia-esque, where, you know, you're expecting a very cultured, uh, curated discussion or something where it's like, how would something like that work? I think it'll only be necessarily cultured at the beginning when <laughs> early adapters, uh, early adopters, you know, tend to, you know, maybe fit because that paradigm. Uh, <laughs> What's that? Behind, behind every article, are some articles on Wikipedia, it's not very cultured. Yes, right. Who owns what job and what's the 
um, you know, the more adoption you get, I think the more that you, you know, start to reach out to, to everyday normal people. Um, I think the very interesting thing about what you said is, is the cross-pollination that you get between different communities and the potential for these systems to break down the filter bubble uh, and to um, create a layer that is a shared um, com conversation layer that bridges um, site, different sites and different domains. And I mean, that's part of the reason why we're in this project is to engage in that, in that uh, <coughs> inquiry. So we have, we have to wrap up, but um, the, just to, to the last question, you guys are both looking out ahead, and you've, you've solved a lot of problems, and you have a few more ahead of you. What do you feel like is the largest uh, challenge that you're facing right now to achieve what you want to do, either from a commenting or annotating or community perspective, that you just haven't solved, and you're just not sure how yet? Haven't solved and not sure how. Um, well, we, we have lot, really we, we have lots of opinions. So um, you know, I, I think what we're focused on right now is is getting launched and getting real users and and getting feedback um, and and working from that and feeding that back into our plans and and how we grow from here. And there's lots of stuff that we don't know um, that we're hoping to find out. So. I'd say that since we're on so many different sites, and we see so many different parts of the web. Um, one of the things that, that surprised me when I joined um, Discuss two years ago, coming in from um, the media side, uh, was just how much the messiness of the browser technology space influences our product space. Because we're, we're really a third party application across the web that's being embedded in all these different um, situations. And as we are in the middle of a major upgrade for our mobile web commenting interface and comment reading interface, we're, we're taking a pretty radically different approach. It's mobile first and, and, and just really trying to understand what we can do on mobile browsers to make it feel really modern and really interactive. Just the, the fact that the, the, the mobile browser space, JavaScript performs um, a, a lot less well uh, on mobile uh, processors. I mean, those kinds of issue, issues, honestly, I wish it, I, we weren't talking about that all the time and as, a, as a constraint, but the basic technology of the web and web browsers, we love the fact that, that we're in the web and the, mess, and the sort of messiness and wildness of the web. It creates the opportunity to connect the dots between all sorts of different pages without being a walled garden. But we also have to deal with the fact that there are all these different browsers and, and trying to make sure that we're always like continuously sort of realigning to user expectations and how user ex expectations about how mobile works and mobile apps work, um, that's actually, a, I think, a really interesting challenge for us from a product development standpoint. Um, because mobile usage, we've seen massively ramping. Um, the expectations are very app-like, but how can we be very app-like but, but um, in, in mobile web? So that's not so much about community building, except that communities are going to form wherever people are and in wherever they're interacting with content. And so um, that's, that's, that's a really interesting challenge for us. Great. Well, thank you to both. Uh, this is fantastic. Really appreciate it.